you say something, you say no. Welcome back. Before we delve into our open day topics, we need to talk about uh, some of the expectations from the Buhari government. We have now been joined by Ajuri Ngelale, a senior special advisor to the president on public affairs. Ajuri, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning and good morning to our viewers. All right. Uh, May 29 is very much behind us. And we're in the third month after the um, inauguration of the president, or after the yeah, inauguration of the president on May 29. Uh, some Nigerians expected that uh, the president would hit the ground running uh, after the um, inauguration June 12. But it took him about three months before we got to know his uh, ministers. Do you think uh, the president has learned lessons? And um, we want to know what we are expecting from the president in the remaining three years and nine months. Thank you very much for that important question, Zika. Um, first of all, you know, a lot has been made of the idea that Mr. President uh, has uh, been slow in putting together his administration. Uh, but I think if you look at the, the complete timeline of events, uh, you would find that that's not quite accurate. In fact, it's inaccurate. Um, first of all, before uh, the election, you require, or just after the election, but before uh, May 29th, uh, when the last uh, Federal Executive Council uh, was preparing to leave office, uh, what we saw were some of the longest uh, Federal Executive Council meetings in the nation's history. The reason why uh, they were so long uh, wasn't just because they liked to greet each other and talk. It was because they had a series, very voluminous uh, sets of memos that needed to be passed ahead of the expiration of May 29th because the president and the administration, the office of the secretary to the government of the federation, the vice president, they understood that they needed to move ahead of schedule so that this gestation period for the new government to be put in place would already be set in terms of the memos that needed to be signed and approved and finalized so that in the interim period you would have the permanent secretaries and the directors and the various MDAs implementing the policies of the previous Federal Executive Council, uh, Federal Executive Council before the establishment of this new Federal Executive Council. So I just want to assure Nigerians this morning that even though there was this gestation period, there was absolutely no slowdown, no lapse in governance because uh, of the vision and forward thinking uh, of President Mohamedou Buhari. Uh, on the second question you asked, which is about uh, what we can expect over the remaining uh, term of this administration. I think you have to look across sectors. Uh, let me start with the economy. Obviously a major issue, uh, and, and, and rightfully so, on the minds of most Nigerian families uh, this morning and always, is that of job creation. Uh, the president has made this a priority. Uh, what we've seen is a presidential, most recently we had a presidential directive uh, on the cot cotton, textile, and garment sector. Uh, if you recall, in the 1980s, uh, the CTG, Cotton, Textiles and Garments, was the second largest employer of labor in the nation uh, after, the, after the actual federal government itself. Uh, we were a major exporter of these uh, materials to other parts of the world. Obviously, that fell apart over the, over the last 30 years or so. So in line with Executive Order Number 3, which is essentially to embrace local content and ensure that the things we can produce locally, we're producing them and we're not importing them anymore. We have a current import bill of about $4 billion annually on cotton, textiles, and garments. We have an opportunity now to create 2 million jobs from that sector alone, put cotton farmers to work. And so there's been a presidential directive that aside from the CBN ban on the import of these items that is progressively being implemented, uh, now MDAs have been directed by the president to ensure uh, through the uh, Bureau of Public Procurement that they are um, uh, assigning contracts with local manufacturers of cotton, textile, and garments. Uh, that's one side. On the other side, you have agriculture. Uh, you recall that in 20, uh, about uh, last, yeah, last year, uh, President Mohamedou Buhari visited uh, U.S. President Donald Trump in the White House. And, you know, a lot of talk was made about, you know, them shaking hands and taking pictures, but very serious 
minded negotiations were taking place. And one of the fruits of those negotiations was a deal with John Deere, uh, the global tractor manufacturer. What's happening is the president has seen is that we need to mechanize our agricultural systems and processes to enhance efficiency and also to expedite uh, the, the speed with which uh, we can produce uh, our agricultural outputs. The implication of that is by 2023, we are going to establish about 780 uh, 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 output centers. This is a mechanization output centers. These are centers that are going to be involved in ensuring that we have uh, maintenance on all of our new uh, agriculture uh, mechanization equipments. That's separate from the yes. tractor, uh, the tractor, the tractor production facilities that will be coming up around the country. And we envisage that that alone is going to create about five million jobs. And that is completely separate from the actual farmers and the value chain that exists in the agri sector that we're uh, employing and also uh, giving the kinds of supplements that they need to enhance agricultural production in the country. All right. Thank you so much for that opening intervention. Yes, uh, very well said, uh, I would want to confess. Uh, uh, but um, let me take you back to your very first um, um, introduction on the first question that Zika asked you about the delay in setting up um, the cabinet. I would like you to respond to this very quickly. Uh, uh, why do we, uh, do, we, do we practice a different kind of democracy in Nigeria that we have to wait uh, uh, a month and more before we could have our cabinet set up? This is happening, uh, this is happening second time in a row in this administration. We waited over six months in the first in the first tenor, and in the second tenor we waited up over 50 days to have this happen. This is not obtainable in other climes. Do we practice a different kind of democracy in Nigeria? Well, I think there's no, it's a fantastic question. I think there's no doubt about the fact that Nigerian democracy does have its own peculiarities. Uh, I think if you look at uh, advanced countries like the United States, uh, and some other Western countries where cabinets are put together in pretty short order, pretty quickly. Uh, you simply don't have to consider some of the, um, the ethnic, religious, and political factors, geopolitical factors uh, within Nigeria uh, in some of those other countries. So for example, obviously, we have federal character principle enshrined in our constitution. You have to ensure that federal character principle is adhered to, that the Constitution is respected. You have to ensure that you're getting the right people from the right places in many cases to ensure that there's that balance. These are things that other uh, foreign administrations simply don't have to deal with. So yes, there are peculiarities. I think even in view of those peculiarities, uh, you would also take a look at the National Assembly, for example, uh, that we have a National Assembly, that a structure in place where the National Assembly is obviously set in place uh, after the inauguration of the president. Uh, so obviously May 29th, the president's inaugurated. Uh, in the second week uh, of June, we have the inauguration of the National Assembly. Then once you have the inauguration of the National Assembly, you have to now uh, figure out the leadership uh, positions, the principal positions that are gonna be established across parties. And then from that point, you're able to sit down and begin a ministerial screening process. I mean, when you look at the series of processes that we have in place uh, that have been provided for us by our founding documents, at least of this fourth republic, uh, you'll know that it's different from, from other countries. And sometimes I think uh, President Muhammadu Buhari is unfairly uh, blamed for uh, some of the you know, constraints that he has to face uh, constitutionally uh, on these issues. This is not his first tenure. He's been the president four years before uh, May 29. And uh, one would like to say that he should have known who would make up his cabinet rather than wait for 50 days to choose them. Is it that he was unaware or he had little or no idea who would make up his cabinet in his second term? Thank you. Uh, first of all, look, we, have a, we also have a vetting process. I didn't touch on this before, uh, but it's extremely important to understand that we have a vetting process. Uh, you can know who it is that you want in your cabinet. You can have a pretty good idea of who it is that you want in your cabinet. But if you want to put them through an, a, a diligent and uh, comprehensive vetting process through the security agencies, obviously we know the Department of State Security has a lot to do with that process 
then you might have somebody in mind. And I'm not uh, obviously singling out anybody or assuming that this happened to anybody. But you might have a process in mind. You submit a name uh, to the security services uh, for, uh, you know, for their uh, kind of uh, check on the box, if you will, their confirmation. And they can come back to you and say, you know, Your Excellency, uh, this is what we found. We're not comfortable with what we've seen in this person's record. This is the thing about uh, this issue. On the one hand, if the president brings a minister on board, all right, uh, and we find out that their record is not what it should be, so for example, we have a certificate scandal. Maybe somebody didn't complete their NYSC. Maybe there, or maybe it's some other academic certificate that was forged or whatever the case may be. When that happens, that's gonna get splashed across all the newspapers in the country, and guess what they're gonna say? They're gonna say, ah, Mr. President didn't do his vetting well. He's not doing well. He's not uh, doing his due diligence. That's what they will say. That's the irony. And so now when Mr. President takes his time to put his nominees through a, an adequate vetting process to ensure that we don't have a repeat of some of the scandals that we've had yesterday, uh, now we say that the president is too slow. I think we need to have a very pragmatic and uh, circumspect view uh, of some of these processes and not try to rush the president into things and also not try to blame him uh, when he takes his time to do what is in the best interest of every Nigerian. I, I, I really want to hope that uh, uh, this will be um, uh, a topic for, for conversation with, within the presidency um, going forward. Now let's move to other issues that are very germane in the hearts of many Nigerians. Uh, insecurity. We have um, in one of our dailies this morning, it says uh, bandits killed 1,460 people in seven months with 330 attacks recorded. This coming from the federal government. Uh, now, Nigerians are still not comfortable with the level of attention that insecurity is getting in recent times. So how does this worry you? I don't know that I agree with the assertion that Nigerians aren't comfortable with the level of attention that insecurity is getting. What I do think is absolutely correct is that Nigerians are extremely concerned and they should be. I think the Nigerians are frustrated that they continue to see casualties and they should be. Uh, these are innocent Nigerians who are losing their lives. Um, but the idea that there is inadequate attention being paid to insecurity is absolutely false. This is an issue, the president has been very open about this. This is an issue that he it stays up at night thinking about, he wakes up early in the morning thinking about. There is nothing that is on the forefront of, of Mr. President's mind than the issue of insecurity and stopping the bloodletting. I think he's been very clear in his public statements that, first of all, you cannot develop a country if that country is not safe. You cannot attract investment if that country is not safe. These are realities that the president understands, which is why it's at the forefront of his mind, which is why we have seen a series of moves, uh, new military formations being moved around the country to ensure that we halt these banditry attacks. Uh, we've seen significant progress in Zamfara. You recall uh, with me that we were seeing 50, 70 uh, people dying on a daily basis in those numbers uh, in Zamfara, uh, just in recent months. We're not seeing quite those, those same casualties. We've seen a slowdown. So you've given us the yearly figure of 2019 so far, but I think if you break it down on a month by month basis from January till now, you would have seen a significant slowdown as a result uh, of the president's actions. Are we there yet? Absolutely not, which is why the president is not resting on his oars. Uh, there's a lot of work still to do in that regard, uh, but clearly this is something that the president cares about. It's something that he's working very hard to address, and he has come out publicly to state to the, uh, to the Nigerian security agencies, particularly the Nigerian army, that anywhere you see a bandit, neutralize him. Don't wait, don't wait. We're not looking for arrests. We're not necessarily looking for uh, some sort of long justice process. If you see a bandit who is lethal, who is, who, ha who is threatening the lives of our people, eliminate that bandit. That is the order. <clears throat> All right, are we looking forward to seeing some rejig in the security architecture? Uh, if you recall recently, there was a clash between the military and the police that saw about three policemen and two civilians uh, who lost their lives. Now, in terms of intelligence gathering amongst the security outfit, do you see the president or the presidency making a, a change in security chiefs or the way things are done? Well, I think there's no doubt about the fact that there's, there, there will at some point, just by virtue of the 
uh, limits on the uh, tenures of the security chiefs. Obviously, there will be changes. Uh, there is obviously a hierarchy within the branches of these services uh, that dictate that indeed change is inevitable. Uh, you are going to have some people who are being prepared, even in the theaters, uh, for general leadership. I mean, at the, at the very top of these organizations. So the president is obviously aware of that. We've seen in recent, uh, recent months some uh, very strategic promotions uh, within the Nigerian army and within some of the other services. I think that that is a pointer to the fact that you will have at some point in the near future uh, a, 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 a reshuffling of, of the deck, so to speak. That's an inevitability. That will happen. The question is when. If you're asking me for a date that has not been established yet, that will be uh, considered uh, at the prerogative of President Mohamedou Buhari. And we will uh, we'll wait his choice, and we certainly will trust uh, that uh, he would uh, engage that decision with utmost discretion and wisdom as a former uh, head of state and general. Uh, just about um, a week ago, there about some Nigerians were arrested in the U.S. Uh, Numbering about about eighty, uh, 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 and then uh, the nation so far is being represented in a very terrible light. Uh, uh, let's look at what uh, your, what the government is doing in terms of image laundry. Eighty people could completely rubbish the the integrity of over two hundred individuals. Tell us what is uh, the government doing in terms of image laundry for the nation. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would say uh, this morning that the, the, the concern should be less uh, about image laundry uh, because that's cosmetic. Uh, that's cosmetic. It's outward. The image more, uh, the issue, uh, the focus more should more, uh, be placed uh, with the greater emphasis on value reorientation within because that's inward. That is what eventually manifests itself in the kinds of outward activities we see in Nigerians both here at home and abroad. Value orientation is where it should start. We need to change the way that we think. We need to change the way that we speak. We need to change the way that we conduct ourselves both in our private and public spaces. I think that if we take this seriously and we start even from uh, the institutions, uh, from you know uh, education for example, we need to reorient our kids. We need to figure out how it is that we're going to adjust our value set settings and systems uh, in such a way that indeed we are a good example uh, for the next generation as we move out into the world. But to your question, uh, once we address the issue of value reorientation, we now need to figure out the perception issues, as you mentioned. To that end, we have seen uh, in recent weeks uh, the announcement, we have had obviously a series of killings in South Africa. I think about 10 so far this year, or they're about, give or take about 10 or 11 uh, this year. Uh, what has happened is the president has, uh, President Mohamedou Buhari has been in touch with President Cyril Ramaphosa to set up a binational commission that would institutionalize the processes that would ensure that very swift and adequate justice is meted out to anybody who is found to be involved in the killing of any Nigerians or any other African uh, indigents, for that matter, within South Africa. Uh, we have set up this binational commission to also ensure that if uh, failure to conduct those measures are, are, uh, occurs in South Africa, we also have uh, retaliatory and response mechanisms in place uh, from our own end. These are some of the proactive uh, measures uh, being taken by Mr. President. And on the large, we need to figure out how it is that we can work out, uh, work with some of our embassies abroad. And we've, uh, I've, we've heard from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jeffrey Onyama, that he's working very actively with embassies around the world uh, to ensure that we begin to really bring our diaspora community together in such a way that we can really rub minds and figure out what it is that we represent in our various countries so that while we're good citizens and good ambassadors within those countries, we're also figuring out how we can uh, group together and, and bring in some of the foreign interests into Nigeria in terms of foreign direct investment, et cetera. So I think a series of measures are being taken, and Nigerians will certainly see the implementation of those measures as time goes on. Uh, we have a visit uh, to South Africa coming up in October where Mr. President will go for the first time in his administration since he took office to visit the South African president and I'm sure we will have more announcements from there. All right, um, you, you touched on the internet fraud that um, we, we got news of earlier this um, week. 
Well, there are other drug-related offenses the Nigerians are alleged to have committed in other countries. I'm, I'm wondering, what is the duty of the NOA? Because it seems it's been quiet for so long and it doesn't, you know, uh, project the image of Nigeria on Nigerians as um, we expect. What is the duty of the NOA? Well, there's no doubt about the fact that the, the very existence of the National Orientation Agency, previously known as MAMSA, as many of us would re recall, um, is to uh, conduct the kind of value reorientation we're talking about. Uh, and that's, that's something that we're going to take a look at to figure out how we can. It's one thing to, uh, you know, kind of adjust uh, value reorientation processes in an institutional setting like the NOA. Uh, it's another thing to try and tailor whatever value reorientation strategies you have in mind to the specific challenges that you face. Uh, obviously, we know that there is a, a drug problem in some parts of the country, a drug export problem, I should say. Uh, we know that the same can be said for weapons proliferation, for kidnapping, uh, for Yahoo Yahoo, as they call it, internet fraud, uh, advanced fee scams, etc. Uh, these are things that can be seen in terms of hot spots. I think if you look at some parts of the country without being very specific about that this morning, you're going to see some hot spots where certain activities are taking place. I think it's now incumbent upon the National Orientation Agency, and I know they're already uh, looking in this direction in collaboration with the Nigerian Diaspora Commission uh, to get to the ground in some of these hot spot areas where you have a, a, a predominance of some of these issues and really engaging with the people in local government by local government. Because you know the NOA is in every local government in this country, 774 local governments. The NOA has a setup in 774 local governments. We're going to leverage on that, and we're going to ensure that we take the sensitization to markets, particularly to schools where you have impressionable young people, and say, look, the way that it's been done in the past, that's not how it can be done in the future if we're going to build a great nation. And that's certainly something that we're looking at, and that's something that we're going to do something about in very short order. Staying with um, value reorientation, uh, we talked about the education sector. We're looking at the sector that is getting a paltry 7.05% of the 2019 budget, which is about um, um, 620.5 billion naira from for the year 2019. Uh, the education sector uh, in itself uh, seems to be an issue at the moment. This is as against the 15 to 20% allocation um, uh, by the UNESCO. Uh, do, do you see our education sector as in a Right, it, I mean, it's right place uh, to propagate this um, value reorientation. No, thank you very much. The education sector is very central to the development of the nation's economy moving forward because obviously we were moving away from natural resources and we're looking at human resources to develop a sustainable and inclusive economy that other nations can now brag about. To your question, uh, one of the things that we have looked at in the next level to ensure that we put in place is a policy in which we are going to prioritize uh, the budgetary allocations of the education sector. But within that, what are we going to do? And the answer to that question uh, is that every year, 10,000 schools, 10,000 public uh, primary and secondary schools within the uh, network of the National Economic Council, because obviously state governments are responsible for primary education, so we have to rub minds together between the federal government and the state governments to make this work. But 10,000 public uh, primary and secondary schools are going to not just be renovated and refurbished, but they're also going to be equipped with the latest in ICT technology and collaborations with companies like Microsoft and Google uh, to ensure that we, we revolutionize the curricula across the nation in every state uh, to embrace STEAM. That's science, technology, uh, uh, mathematics, arts, etc. Uh, machine thinking, we're, we have, uh, we're bringing in robotics, we're bringing in coding, we're bringing in practical education uh, into our curricula. That, that is a key component uh, as we begin the next level. So uh, from public infrastructure to the actual uh, content of what children are learning, we are addressing those issues within the next level document. Again, we're also retraining our teachers because you cannot teach a child what you do not have. 
So we are trying to ensure that all of our teachers around the country, particularly those publicly employed, are going to be retrained in the area of digi digital literacy because they have to be able to uh, advance uh, you know, the, the cause of, uh, of, of ICT-driven education, and they're not going to be able to do that if they're not equipped. So that's extremely important. On the other side of that, I think it's really important that we look at some of the other sectors where we have built in to the education system. I'll give you an example. We know that within the social investment program, uh, we currently have 9.8, it turns out, 9.8 uh, Nigerian school children in the school feeding program. That is enhanced enrollment rates. By 2023, we are going to advance that number to about 15 million uh, Nigerians. Uh, that is a very significant uh, milestone once we get there. Uh, so I think you're going to see enhanced enrollment, and I also think that you're going to see a comprehensive revolution of the nation's education sector, because really, that's the only chance that the future of this country has that we'd have loved to touch on, but um, time is against us. But let's talk about the issue of um, power generation, uh, which of course we know is the bane of a lot of businesses in Nigeria, especially the small and medium scale enterprises. Uh, despite you know, the um, uh, Executive Order 3, the President had uh, signed into action some years back. What do you think can be done to improve the power sector? What are the plans of the President to improve the power sector? Well, uh, the, the, at the forefront of that certainly is going to be the most recently signed uh, Siemens deal, the deal with the global uh, engineering giant Siemens from Germany. Uh, we had their global leadership come in just a few weeks ago to sign that memoranda of understanding with the federal government. What that is going to entail is this. Uh, we have seen over the last four years, because again, if you're talking about the next level, you have to talk about what it is that has gotten us to this point. Over the last four years, there has been a gradual improvement in power generation and transmission, but there has been very little uh, improvement in power distribution because those are privately owned companies in which the government cannot uh, intervene. Uh, so you have about 7,000 megawatts currently available in power generation. You have nearly 7,000 megawatts, or I think it's nearly 8,000 megawatts in power transmission capability, but you only have 3,500 megawatts in power distribution capacity amongst the privatized disco, uh, discos. Now, what the Siemens deal is going to do is that Mr. President, in his wisdom, has said, we're not going to build new power plants and enhance generation if we can't distribute it to homes and businesses. So we're going to focus this plan on distribution, fixing distribution so that available power is getting into homes and businesses so that we can have steady running light across the country. So by 2021, which is two years from now, you're going to see an escalation from 3,500 megawatts distribution capacity to 7,000 megawatts distribution capacity, which obviously means that we are going to to be uh, moving all of that generation capacity into the homes and businesses of Nigerians. By 2023, because we are simultaneously building some other plants that have been ongoing now for the last four years plus, uh, we are going to have a generation capacity of about 11,000 megawatts transmission capacity of 11,000 megawatts and ultimately distribution capacity of 11,000 megawatts by 2023 within this Siemens deal. If we get to 11,000 megawatts, which I'm certain we will, uh, you're going to see constant running light around this country by the end of this administration. And certainly it helps that we now have a National Assembly in place led by Senate President Ahmad Lawan, who is not going to be intentionally underfunding critical power and uh, works uh, projects uh, for political purposes. He's going to be ensuring that the uh, presidential administration of President Mohamedou Buhari gets all of the budget support it needs to ensure that this Siemens deal is fully funded and, and effectively implemented. Before we let you go, we, we are running out of time, but before we let you go quickly, you keep talking about the next level, and we are a bit more concerned about the architect, uh, the architecture of the next level. Some people have described um, the new uh, administration, the makeup uh, as a, 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 a payment for loyalty, reward for, for, for loyalty uh, to the boys. How would you describe this shortly? Well, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. If the president makes a selection, because you know you, ha you have different opinions, I guess your perspective is based on where you sit, as they say. Some people will look at the administration and will say, "Wow, I see talented administrators. I see I, I see people that have uh, significant resumes in their in their professions of uh, uh, in their areas of professional endeavor." 
Uh, other people will say, oh, these are political paybacks because this person was once a member of ACN or this person was once a member of CPC. And, you know, uh, look, the question about, about, you know, competence, professional competence is determined by your experience. I think when you look at the resumes of the, of the nominees of the president, now, of course, they're not nominees. They are uh, fully on board as ministers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You would find that these are very, uh, these are very accomplished uh, Nigerians with very, uh, you know, enviable records. And I think if we, put, if we begin to put political coloration on everything that the president does or does not do, uh, we tend to overlook the fact that these are uh, very well-resourced, uh, very experienced, rich Nigerians who have a lot to offer. Jirun Gelali, uh, Senior Special Advisor to the President on Public Affairs, thank you so much for your time with us. Thank you so much. All right, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we, uh, our open day discussions will begin. Please stay with us. Here, the controversy ends.